Debbie Adler, welcome to the Urban Pharmacy Podcast. Thank you so much. Super excited to have you here today, not only because of the amazing plant message that you are sharing with the world, but also because of you and the spark for entrepreneurship to be part of change. Um, I think it's incredibly intriguing, and I want to talk about that um, today as I go through this interview with you. Um, first off, let's just get started with helping people understand who you are and what you do. So I am a, uh, an entrepreneur in the whole food plant-based space where I create courses so people can learn how to bake and cook out a whole food plant-based vegan. And I'm also a bakery owner. Uh, I own a, a vegan plant-based sugar-free gluten-free bakery in Los Angeles. And, um, I have meal plans, uh, seasonal meal plans. So people, you know, who don't know what to make for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whole food plant-based, they could just look at the meal plan. Oh, okay. Lunch is this dinner is that, oh, these are some snacks. So I do meal plans as well. And, uh, and then that's basically it. I love it. So good. I can't wait to hear a little bit more about your bakery. Um, you had to shut that down obviously during COVID, right? Oh uh, yeah. During COVID. Yes. And mm -hmm. everything's up and running now back in yes. 2022. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great. Fabulous. I'm glad to know that you made it through and that you, you guys have persevered. So yes, thank um, you. this is great, great news. We need a bakery like that here in Indiana. We have nothing. We have oh. nothing like that. I would have to be the one that would open it, which would don't put that past me because I used to work in bakeries and I really think that I could have a really good bakery here someday, but you know, I might yeah. need to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell me about your journey to plant-based eating and, um, where that all started for you. And then we'll kind of talk, this might intertwine with your family story as well. Um, and how you kind of started writing recipes. Well, my journey started Back in 2005 or six, I was hungry for a cupcake and I didn't want it to have sugar. And I went out, I looked and all the health food stores and bakery, no, there was nothing. It, it just didn't exist. It, they used sucralose at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, oh, I can't believe I'm going to be ha ha have to be the one to do this. I wasn't a baker. I wasn't a cook. Um, and I did. I went into my kitchen and I just I started to... Uh, just experiment with different sugar substitutes at the time the popular thing was xylitol mm -hmm. i don't use that anymore but at the time that's that was really uh, the sugar alcohols were the most popular thing um and i started to get good feedback from my friends oh my god you should open a bakery so that was my first foray into the food industry i did other things before that i was a cpa on wall street um but this was new to me, but I was excited by it because I, I, you know, this is quite a while ago, uh, was very interested in how to make desserts sugar-free. I have a, I have a sweet tooth and I knew sugar wasn't good for us. And, you know, that kind of thinking is prevalent now, but at the time people were saying, oh, get off your high horse. It's all a little sugar doesn't hurt, but we do know that a little sugar adds up and it does hurt. So mm -hmm. I was very alone in my thinking at the time, but I opened the bakery anyway. And sure enough, there were a lot of people who were very interested in it and they wanted that. And so that was my first foray. Then in 2008, my son was born with severe and life-threatening food allergies. And he one of the first things he anaphylaxed to was casein, which is a protein found in milk. And I couldn't understand why he had these allergies, why 13 or 15 million kids in the United States alone have these allergies, these food allergies. And so I started to do research and I came upon the China study by Dr. T. Colin Campbell, which talked about this 30 year study in China where they gave the people casein. Casein was the protein they decided to use. And I was over the moon excited that they found nobody should be eating casein, that, let alone if you're allergic to it, because this harms our bodies. It causes prostate cancer, it causes ovarian cancer. And things started to make sense to me 
that we are rejecting these things that we shouldn't be eating like dairy, like eggs. That was another thing my son was allergic to. And he talks about the whole food plant-based diet, which is based on eating legumes and, you know, grains and, you know, vegetables and fruits. And that this is a preventative way to not get sick or if you're sick to reverse the disease. And I was over the moon excited. I came home, I talked to my husband, who's a physician. And I said, you have to tell your patients about this because this is the way they will get healthy, let alone... I mean, okay, you know, some are diabetic, they need insulin, but maybe they can get off their insulin. I was just like hitting the ceiling because I went to some conferences where I met Dr. Uh, Campbell and Dr. Greger and Dr. Esselstein, and they talked about this and they had their patients on the stage with them. And they were saying about their journey, uh, how they got well. And um, so my husband didn't think he wasn't there, unfortunately, at the conferences with me, but a year later, a a uh, resident of my of my husband's came up to him and he said, Dr. Adler, I think that we should be talking to our patients about a whole food plant-based diet. And my husband said, oh, talk to my wife. So that, that and, then, and then my husband was on board after he heard it from his resident, not from me. Mm, so that was my entree into whole food plant-based cooking. And I started to make the meals myself. I started to experiment. Uh, by the way, I was vegan already. I had just never liked meat, but the whole food plant-based also excludes salt, oil, and sugar. Mm -hmm. So I eliminated those things. I mean, I never had the sugar either, but I incorporated the no oil. So that was a new thing for me because I was sauteing in oil. I figured out how not to saute in oil, use other things like apple cider vinegar, coconut aminos, carrot juice, anything else, water, anything but but uh, uh, but uh, oil. And then a year later, after I read the China study, the publisher of the China study published my second book, Sweet, Savory, and Free. And so that was like, uh, you know, cemented my expertise in, in the whole food plant-based world. So, mm -hmm. you know, people started to know more about me because of the book. And then... Um, my followers were asking for Mediterranean. So I said, oh, that's my next book is Mediterranean, you know, because th they don't know how to do it without olive oil, without without salt, without the meat, without the fish, without the feta. So right. that was how I, I came to this point where I wanted to do a book, a Mediterranean plant-based book. I love it so much. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you're, this Mediterranean one is SOS free as well, correct? Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I'm curious about olives. Did you get to get olives into those recipes? Oh yeah. Olives are fine. Yeah. Olives are good. No, it's just, it's just the refined oil no, that not. they say mm -hmm. uh, clogs your arteries and empty calories, no nutrition, but olives are fine. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Awesome. So, all right. Kind of backing up. Um, what was it like to have a child that could not consume a lot of foods that you had maybe planned on feeding them? Well, it was hard. It was stressful because this could mean life or death. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a child that could die from a food, you're, you're uh, very, very careful and you do your research, any mom would, and you make sure you have the safe foods in the house. And then when they go out like to school, you make sure they have their food with them. And not only that, but it was a whole setup with the with the my child having to sit on the corner of the table, a teacher being the buffer, and then the kids next to the teacher. So the food wouldn't the kids food wouldn't interact with my son's food. It was just so um, it's hard. You know, I really uh feel for people who are going through this because I went through it and I talk about it in the past tense because 10 years later, when my son was 10, he got into a protocol at UCLA, um, which was in conjunction with Stanford, a, a, a clinical trial where they um, gave the kids, the, the food allergy kids, the allergens in, in minute quantities, but, but all at a time. Like you could do five, you could do 10, wow. we did five and he was able to desensitize. My son was able to desensitize to the five major allergens that he, that were dangerous for him. And so now he can 
eat out. We never used to eat in, in a restaurant for 10 years. We couldn't go to a restaurant. We couldn't go on a plane. And now those things are available to us. So it's like, ah, oh, you know, this burden just lifted off our shoulders mm-hmm. and I could serve other foods. I could have nuts in the house, whereas before I couldn't. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. Yeah. What do you suggest for those who don't have access to that incredible micro dosing like you guys oh. had? It's all over the country now. They they could go go to their allergist and ask for it. It is a protocol that has been given. The UCLA Stanford protocol has been shared with every allergist that is willing to take it. So please ask your allergist to send you to a place. If they don't do it, where can you go? What hospital? If it's not their office, what hospital in your area provides it because they all do some sort of desensitization protocols now. Fantastic. So good. I just hear so many parents struggling with food allergy still, and, um, it's, it's not good. Um, what do you think that Debbie, just, uh, before I kind of move on from the allergy thing, what do you think causes so many food allergies? Do you have a theory on that? Yeah. You know, there are a lot of theories and, and so everyone has their own theory. Well, we're too clean. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Right. Or, or, um, I, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, GMOs were introduced into our food system in 1984. Mm -hmm. So in 1984, if you look at the, the map or, or a graph, let's say, you see there is a um, correlation between autism and food allergies and GMOs being put into our food system that goes like this up until today, like a, a continuous rise. And before 1984, it wasn't that prevalent. Now food allergies are more prevalent because we're messing with our food supply. We're putting in genetically modified things into the soil and we're eating things that maybe our bodies don't identi- cannot identify as food. They're thinking, oh, this is a foreign object. I'm going to react to that. So mm-hmm. that's part of it, I think. Another part of it that's definitely a, um, a contributing factor is if your parents have allergies, not necessarily food allergies, but if they have seasonal allergies, if they had asthma as a child, your chance of having a child with food allergies is exponentially greater because of epigenetics. The genes start to replicate in in a, a more powerful way and express the thing that you had onto them. And then it becomes something else like a food allergy. So I think that's a, a definite contributing factor as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so is your, are all of your books gluten-free? Yes. Okay. So yes, no gluten, they are no gluten in any of them. Okay. Great. No. Wonderful. Um, okay. Speak to me now about what, what you do at your bakery. What do you guys sell at your bakery? Maybe we have some people that live in LA <laughs> and do no, you, do ship. you spend, what do you do with your bakery? Do you guys ship? We ship. Yeah, no, we ship. And so since the end of the pandemic, we are only shipping uh, some cookies and some um, all all granola bars. So every month you can you can get on my email list because that's how you'll find out about the new flavor of the month. So, you know, like like October was pumpkin chocolate chip. it, it's every month. It depends on the season. You'll get an email about what flavor. So that's what we're selling now is it's the granola bars. And then every so often I do a cookie like in, um, I think it was April. I did a hummantaschen, which is a triangular cookie for Purim, which is a Jewish holiday. It's a triangular cookie. And I put in chia jam. Usually Ooh. people put in anything like, uh, you know, um, chocolate or jelly or apricot. I use chia gym and it just was so popular. I couldn't believe the response. Like you never know what kind of response you're going to get. Yeah. I thought it was a very niche type of thing to do. It was, I was very passionate about it because the po- the Ukrainian war had just broken out and the Polish um, organizations were helping the refugees. And I thought I, I want to donate to them to help get the refugees in. So I thought this was a good way to raise money to be able to help the refugees. So that's what I did. The Homantashen were, it was um, 
humanity for human touch or something like that. And that was that that was my most popular thing that I ever wow. did. Wow. That's awesome. So, and you've been doing this bakery thing for how long now? Since 2006. Wow. That yeah. is, that is amazing. Wow. You're approaching the 20 year mark, Debbie. This is crazy. That's awesome. Okay. So you, you must have a great following now. Uh, people are, people know that you create amazing things. Let's, let's stay on the bakery for a second, because I've been an entrepreneur for a while. Um, I, I used to own a Pilates studio that was a brick and mortar ownership. So I do understand that in a sense. Um, let's, can you explain to me what, um, your least favorite part about entrepreneurship is? We have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to this. Oh, okay. I, you know, um, I, I would say maybe doing the books. <laughs> I don't have I'm a CPA. So I, I, I feel like I shouldn't have to hire an accountant. So I do the books and, and that's a pain. It really is. Oh, I know? thought you meant, I thought you meant the cookbooks for a minute and I'm like, what? No. Okay. Okay. We're the, talking about the bakery. Oh no, 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 no. Oh no. <laughs> no I no. love doing, no, I love doing the cookbooks. Yes. No, okay. I mean, I mean the accounting. Oh yes. The accounting the is very detail oriented. And I mean, I'm detail oriented, but the books are, I, the, I should be very clear. The um, accounting that I do um, is is tedious, mm-hmm. and that is my least favorite part. When I do it, it's like, oh, you know, it's because it's just for ta- you know, for tax purposes and everything right. like that. Right. That's that's that that's the part you know that's not creative. Yes, for sure. So your most favorite part is it recipe creating? Is that yes. 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 So do you do a lot of testing in your own kitchen and then bring it to the bakery? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do the testing in my own kitchen and I have a lot of stuff in my freezer. Oh yeah. (laughs) I can imagine. And that's, yeah. So the best gets to the bakery. Yes. And your family gets to reap the rewards at home, which is great. Exactly. Yes. I love that. I love that. And friends. I'm very generous. Yeah. Yeah. Give gifts. Do you have a tip that you could share um, that you think would be beneficial for anybody that wants to start their own business, regardless if it's a brick or mortar, or regardless if it's something online, or maybe they start selling something at the farmer's market. Cause that's what we do. That's what we, oh. where, where we started with our stuff. Um, uh-huh. and, um, yeah. Do you have any insight or any, just like a tip that a you would want to share? Yeah, sure. Um, if you, if you want to start your own business i you know first have a passion for whatever you're doing because if you're just doing it to make money it's not going to work it, because it's so hard and you have to be very persistent that if you really don't love your product or whatever it is you're selling even if it's a service you've got to love it and have the most passion for it that you've ever had for anything because it won't work you can't do it for the money And um, so that's the first thing I would say passion will get you through the hard times. And because you'll, because you'll believe in your product or service so deeply that any naysayers will just, you, you won't listen to the naysayers because you'll, you'll know, oh no, no, people need my, 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 and, and, and talking about that, you should maybe do some research, maybe maybe you're passionate about it, but maybe other people won't be. And maybe you should do some market research beforehand to find out if you have an email list, ask them questions. Would you be interested in this? Would you buy this if I put it out on the market? Ask, if you don't have an email list, ask friends, uh, you know, do some surveys because you do want to know that people will buy it. Yeah. You you don't want to put something out there that people just say, what? You know, so you want to make sure there is a market for it. And then have the passion and then go for it. Love it. Thank you for that insight. Um, okay. Can we talk about your two, the two books that you had out currently were called what? They one well, both were allergy, both were the top allergy. Yeah. Top eight allergy free. So Sweet Debbie's Organic Treats was my very first book, all based on my bakery everything we sold at the bakery and then some even more things were in the book than I sold at the bakery. That was the first book. It's all dessert, sweet Debbie's organic treats. Then in uh, 2017, the publisher of the China study 
approached me to do a whole food plant-based cookbook that was top eight allergy free. And so that was my second book, Sweet, Savory, and Free. And then recently I did the Mediterranean plate because people were asking me, I, I love Mediterranean food, but how do you do it without olive oil? How do you do it without meat? How do you do it without feta? How do you do it without fish? And that was my next project was the Mediterranean plate, which just came out last Tuesday. Love it. Yes. So the, um, the top eight allergens, do you know them off the top of your head? No pressure if you don't. Yeah, no, it's a dairy, eggs, wheat, um, fish, selfish. Um, what are the last three? I always, um, nuts and seeds of some sort. Nuts, right, right, right. Nut, right. Nuts, uh, tree nuts and peanuts mm, are. Yeah. So, so did you just use a lot of seeds? then to yeah right that. exactly so um as the substitute like if you want to make a plant-based milk or a plant-based um uh, or allergy-free sauce instead of cashews you use sunflower seeds if you want to make a peanut butter without peanuts you roast the sunflower seeds and it tastes exactly like peanut butter mm -hmm. so little tricks i figured out that you're not going to miss the nuts Love it. And with your Mediterranean dishes, now I'm starting to think, cause I don't have the book yet, but, um, what would you do for what, what did you do for like fish? Like, how would you replace that? Are you using mushrooms? Are you using the same types of flavors that would be used on, um, mm -hmm. the, the fish, um, or, yeah. like, you know, yeah. are you Right. So if, if there's a, a recipe that people like, you figure out, well, okay, so I'll use tofu and I'll bake it and I'll use the sauce that is used in the conventional recipe, but I'm going to use that sauce on the tofu and I'm going to, you know, use the herbs and spices and a lemon and maybe some, um, some uh, seaweed to make it fishy and, mm -hmm. and so you figure it out and you test and you, you know, tweak and then it tastes not exactly but it tastes very fulfilling and satisfying. Mm -hmm. I love that. And what is your, um, are you using tofu for like feta replacement? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That does wonderfully. Do. Are you doing like the trick where you freeze it first? Not, not for the feta. No, Got it. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it, it, I, I've just seen that it gives a different texture to it Oh. and okay. it creates like I don't know, more holes in it. It's fascinating. Oh, but okay. I have, yeah. I have froze tofu before and it was interesting how it changed the texture. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that it this is so helpful for people that really want to, they want the, the flavors of their, of their regular comfort foods yes. and Mediterranean food is comforting, even though it is quite healthy in a, in a generalized sense, there's also a lot of, um, comfort foods in there. So that brings me to my next question. Are you, do you have pasta dishes in there? Yes, I do. Yeah. But, but I, you, yes, I use that, those pastas that have the beans yes. in it. So it's gluten-free. Yes. And I just heard of a new Debbie. I don't know if you've heard of this yet, but it starts with a B. I really wish I could say exactly what it's called, but it's actually used, um, the byproduct of like soy milk production, it is actually soy flour. Um, and it's, I believe the highest protein flour that, mm -hmm. um, is out there mm -hmm. so far. And, um, supposedly it's great for pastas. So, oh. um, interesting to see if that's going to come out, um, yeah. next in the pasta alternative world, but the bean ones have been really good in terms of performance. I feel like edamame pastas, um, right. And then mm -hmm. the lentil mm -hmm. pastas and yeah. which one is your favorite? I like the bonza ones. They make it with chickpeas. Oh, with chickpeas. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Can you explain to me, um, maybe your top three recipes that are in the book top that are your, that are your of... favorite? Oh, my favorite. Okay. Yes. So my favorites are the muhamara, which is a sweet, um, it's sort of like a, like a hummus, but made with red bell peppers. And it's, uh, it's so good. It's a, it's a Syrian spread. It's very popular in the Middle East. And I serve it every time I have company, people devour it. It's just delicious. 
And then um, I would say the moussaka with bechamel, with mushroom bechamel is a favorite. It's so, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like a shepherd's pie meets lasagna. It's just Yum. very, very good. It has a, a layering of eggplant and then lentils topped with a mashed potato. But I also use cauliflower in the mashed potato. So oh, yeah. it's- yeah, so yummy. And then on top of that is that mushroom bechamel, which is very creamy and mushrooms. And um, that's very decadent and good. And I would say my chocolate orange bis biscotti is my favorite dessert. It's just very good to dunk into coffee or tea. And even on its own, it's just so delicious. I can't explain it. This is like a combination of chocolate and orange, which I love. It's a Greek type of biscotti. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a great, that's a great combination. Um, what are your, your favorite types of flowers, Debbie, to bake with? Are you like partial to oat flour? Are you even using oat? Or was oat in one of those top, in the top allergens, by the way? I know that that. No, oh, no, oats are fine. Oats are not okay. allergenic. Um, well, I have a mix at my bakery uh, that I came up with that is hot because at the time in 2006, the only gluten-free flours had rice flour in them that's mm -hmm. it it was grainy yeah you know, having oh, I remember yeah I remember when I remember it was, it was very grainy. very grainy and it it it's not the healthiest thing to have tons and tons of rice mm -hmm. in your body like that and it's high glycemic mm -hmm. so I set out to create the fab four I found the best performing gluten-free high protein very powdery luscious flours that performed well in baking. And those were sorghum, millet, quinoa, and tapioca. Mm -hmm. And the, I use them in a certain proportion to make a gluten-free all-purpose flour mix. And that is what I use to bake. Now in my book, the recent one, the, the Mediterranean plate, a lot of recipes I tell you you know what, use just almond flour for this one. You don't have to make the mix, but certain ones do use the mix and the recipe for the mix is in the book. So awesome. if you make the mix and you have it in your freezer, you could keep it there for a year in an airtight container. So just make it once and then you're done. And then when you need to bake, you just grab it. And, you know, and, and so I play around with flowers in this new book with oat flour, with almond flour. So it's not just that mix. Awesome. Do you think that this book is good for even beginner cooks? Or do you think that you know have a little bit of knife skills in the kitchen? No, I think it's an easy book. It's I, I you know, because I, I know that a lot of people are very tentative about going into the kitchen, and they don't like to cook necessarily. So I didn't want people to be turned off. I mean, that is not my goal. My goal mm -hmm. is for there to be entree into this way of life. So I make it as easy as possible. I make it in everything in one pot. I want everyone to cook this way. See, that is my purpose. I just want everyone to know how to do it so they can do it for themselves and their families and then not get sick. So Absolutely. no barrier to entry. If you know how to read, you know how to cook from this book. Love it. And did you say that there's any breakfasts in that book? Yes, there's a whole chapter of breakfasts. Wow. What are some common Mediterranean breakfasts? Well, you know, my, my breakfasts are not common. Um, <laughs> they're um, avocado toast with veg. I tell you how to make a vegan egg. Oh, so if you fun. look at the, if you look at the picture, uh, are you uh, is this, will they be able I to see, see it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. For, the, like for those that watch YouTube. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't want anyone to think that this is a real egg because I've had that uh, comment before. This is not a real egg. Oh my word. That's my veg. That's my veg. Okay. <laughs> uh, these are my matcha cotta souffle pancakes. Oh my goodness. Wow. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm not, uh, these are falafel waffles. Oh yes. So it's sort of like a take on the Mediterranean and I just make it my own fava bean porridge. Wow. So good. Lots of protein, lots of beans. Yeah. So it's like oatmeal, you know, fig oatmeal, you know, figs, Greek, you know, so it's just yeah. a play on, 
a play on the Mediterranean and I, I just make it my own creative. Oh, you're gonna love this. Spanakopita omelet, no um, eggs. So um, things that you just, if you look at the picture, you're gonna think I use eggs and they're no eggs. That's amazing. I'm so yeah. excited. This is a perfect Christmas gift or, or holiday gift or whatever yes. you celebrate gift. Right. Um, right. And it's just a good gift in general for people that want good flavor. I'm sure. Um, are you using, I know this is very random, but is sumac used in the Mediterranean? Is what? Sumac. Sumac. That's I more. Don't, I don't use it. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's definitely not, it's not Mediterranean. Okay. That was very random. Um, all right, Debbie, is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners in regards to food allergies, cooking, um, veganizing your meals, entrepreneurship? We kind of bounced around today, but I wanted to just share your, um, your energy and share your gifts with the world and let people know about you and make sure that they start following you. And, um, you say you Thank have some you. programs that can help people. Yeah. So we'll talk about gifts. I'm giving a gift. If people buy the book, I'm giving away a $200 course where I show them personally in my kitchen on video, how to make every single recipe in the book. So that's a hey, gift. Then. So if they, if they purchase it, just send me a screenshot of the order or the receipt, whatever they want. And email it to me at Debbie at Debbie TV. And I will send them it, it's a it's um it's actually a login. They log into my platform and it's in their library, a course where they get every single recipe um, made, you know, on video where I show them how to do it. So that that's a gift for everyone who watches your, you know, this this program. Um and, you know, if, if anyone ever has questions, I want them to be able to feel free to contact me at that address, or you could follow me on Instagram at plant.base.debbie.adler. Uh, and then I do little demo reels there. You know, people could see how I make my things and learn more. Um, or go to www.debbieadler.tv where they can opt in and get 18 free recipes right off the bat. Wow. Lovely so many good resources to help people get in on the plant game and come over to the green side and yeah. experience the health benefits, the energy shifts and, um, the kindness that yes, it embodies. So thank you so much, Debbie. We appreciate you. We will make sure to have all of your resources in the show notes. And, um, I can't wait to get my hand on that book. It <laughs> sounds delicious. I'm like, souffle that I can't get that off my mind. That sounds really great. So I'm excited. Thank you, Stacy. Thank for you having so me. much for your time. Okay. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.